To preface this video, I have to honestly say that the solutions proposed by anarchists to the free rider problem of national defense have really been a joke. In the last few days, if I had been a statist, and if I had listened to the anarchists talk about defense, all their verbiage, this would have reaffirmed my statist positions by convincing me that the alternatives were ridiculous. The so-called solutions I've heard anarchists propose with sincerity as being legitimate solutions to the free rider problem of defense are a sham, a cruel joke, an ahistorical bit of junk reasoning. In this video, I'm going to undermine and destroy this nonsense on stilts proposed by my fellow travelers. I will try to explain how national defense in a stateless society is a real, unaddressed free rider problem while simultaneously demonstrating why the proposed solutions of anarchists that have been given to the problem don't address the real problem. Only when the slate has been wiped clean of bad arguments will I explain in subsequent videos my solution to the free rider problem. Although at the end of this video I may uh, highlight my position in brief, right, just to give people an idea. And as always, links to everything I say or quote are in the video description. Before I begin, let me clarify what I mean by national defense. By national defense, I don't mean to imply there is any nation in a stateless society. I mean to imply that firms providing national defense are engaged in providing a service which includes, but is not limited to, deterring an invasion and hostile takeover of a relevant region by an opposing army, as well as conducting defensive wars which respond tit-for-tat to foreign or domestic aggression. The operational parameters of national defense firms may also include dismantling and protecting civilians against other unconventional security threats such as terrorist organizations that unlawfully use violence or the threat of violence to coerce or intimidate societies in the pursuit of ideological or political goals. I also mean to suggest that national defense providers are not in the business of protecting civilians from common criminals or criminal syndicates. This is an issue that is dealt with by local defense. Before I go into the pre free rider problem of national defense, I think it would be useful to operationally define what public goods and private goods are to make the distinction clear because and how the problem is of free riders is inherent in different ways to the issue of public goods. I will do this because it seems that many anarchists don't seem to understand the distinction between public and private goods. What is a public good? In economics, a public good is any good or service that is both non-rival and non-exclusive. What do I mean by non-exclusive? I mean that one cannot be excluded from consuming the good regardless if one pays for it or not. Radio stations are currently a good example of this. If I purchase any standard radio, I can tune into any AM or FM radio station within range of my radio, and the radio station can't exclude me from listening as long as they provide their service. What do I mean by non-rival? I mean that consumption of this good or service by one consumer does not prevent simultaneous consumption of that unit by other consumers. If I listen to my radio, does this prevent others from listening to their radio broadcasts? No, it doesn't. My consumption of radio broadcasts does not interfere with the consumption of radio, the radio broadcasts of others. Let's contrast public goods with private goods. A private good is any good that is rival and excludable. A good is rival in the sense that if I consume a cheeseburger, this fact precludes other people from consuming my cheeseburger. If a good is excludable, it is so in the sense that if I don't pay for it, I don't receive it. If I don't pay for a cheeseburger, then I don't get a cheeseburger. Unlike public goods, Firms and individuals can deny people private goods if they don't pay for them. However, it's worth noting that types of goods, such as public goods, aren't necessarily static. New technology can sometimes be used to turn what used to be a private good into a public good or another type of good. For instance, we know that traditional radio stations 
that uh, traditional radio stations can't prevent other people from listening in on our broadcasts. If I listen to the radio, this doesn't prevent others from also listening as well. And if I don't pay for the service, I still get to listen. However, the invention of the technology of satellite radio stations, such as XM Satellite Radio, require the use of a special digital radio receiver to tune into their broadcasts. This development allows uh, the Cyrus Radio Corporation to exclude people who don't pay a fee. Thus, the technology of the Cyrus XM Radio Corporation was able to turn a public good into a club good, a non-rival but excludable good. Now, let's move on to the free router problem of defense in a stateless society, which should appear a little bit more obvious at this point. National defense is a public good. If I don't pay for it, I don't get excluded. For instance, if I free ride and an imperialist army invades my region, the national defense firms in the area can't de just decide to protect all the other houses but mine. They have to protect the entire area or they'll lose. Hence, I get the benefit of defense while paying none of the cost. National defense is non-rivalrous because my consumption of it doesn't preclude other people from being defended. Either we're defended or not. Now, suppose for the sake of argument then in a stateless society, paying for national defense costs $500 per year. Suppose also that at the end of the financial year, I have $500 in disposable income. Suppose the following are my only options, to either pay for defense or to pay for a flat screen TV. In this circumstance, what is the opportunity cost of for defense? It's a flat screen TV and all the utility I would derive from having a flat screen TV. What is the opportunity cost for buying a flat screen TV to me and society and not paying for defense? To me, the cost is nothing because I receive the benefits of national defense whether or not I pay for it. To society, the cost of me not paying for defense is almost nothing. It isn't statistically significant. National defense has extremely high fixed costs. The average annual absolute expenditure of the top military spending states is $118,689,000,000. Of those very same countries, the average per capita military spending is $766. So our, our, so, uh, our assumption of $500 is $266 less than the current per capita average of those countries. In modern society, as well as a stateless society, $500 is a grain of sand in the desert. If I don't pay for defense, it doesn't affect anything in the grand scheme of things. It means one soldier won't get a ha like, you know, there'll be one less helmet for soldiers to get. Won't make any difference. Thus, we say that it is individually rational for me to free ride, and it is individually irrational for me to pay for defense. This is because, if I spend my money on defense, I will receive no additional services that cause me utility. If I instead spend my money on other things which do cause me utility, I will be better off and happier. The problem is, if everyone thinks this way, i.e. is individually rational, then no one will pay for defense. In the event of a hostile invasion, the relevant region or subnational unit will be screwed, taken over, and plundered, and it will be constantly at risk for invasion. The problem for national defense entails that although it is individually rational not to pay for defense, it is still collectively rational to pay for defense in order to ensure enough domestic security required for the economy to function efficiently and to avoid the terrors, wealth destruction, and bloodshed of war. The problem of free riders and national defense entails that when people in society are being individually rational regarding national defense, the collective result is very irrational and unoptimal. A similar problem of rationality is with democracy. In a democratic government, it is collectively rational if everyone who votes is informed about the person they're voting for so that they choose leaders who create policies to best support their interests and the health of the society in general. 
However, as there are millions upon millions of voters, the likelihood that one individual vote will influence an election statistically approaches zero. Thus, it is individually rational for all citizens not to vote, or, if they do vote, to be ignorant of the person they're voting for. This is because the more time they spend learning about the candidates, which gives them no benefit whatsoever as the vote doesn't matter, the less time they can spend gaining utility from doing other things. So they're better off being ignorant. It is worth mentioning that the state does actually have a solution to this free rider problem. The state uses force and the threat of force to ensure that its citizens pay taxes. With part of the tax revenue the state collects, they pay their own military. Thus, since people are forced to pay the balance of military costs year after year, defense is provided. Now, do I think the state solution is the only solution to the pre-rider problem? No, but it's worth mentioning that the state has a solution, and this is one way to solve the problem. Now that we have defined what the problem of national defense is in a stateless society, let us move on to why the answers anarchists have proposed to this problem are wrong. As a quick note, I will be referring to national defense firms by the abbreviation NDF and to the national defense industry by the abbreviation NDI. Number one, donations. The first solution proposed by anarchists to address the free rider problem is what I call the donation argument for defense. Advocates of this position point out that Americans currently give about $300 billion per year to charity. They argue that in a, st a stateless society, individuals would have more disposable income to donate, as they wouldn't be paying taxes. They could then use their extra income to donate to their preferred national defense provider. Advocates point out that donations to national defense would increase when society was under the threat of war, and in times of peace they would substantially decrease. Thus, goes the argument, the threat of conflict coupled with donations would hopefully provide enough resources to mount an effective defense. Now, let's tip over this house of cards, shall we? This idea is a non-solution for several reasons. First and foremost, if we assume NDFs are funded exclusively by donations, like charities are today, we have to assume that the market for NDFs will look similar to the markets of ch for charities today. The market for charities is a market of monopolistic competitors. The characteristics of the market for charities are as follows. There are a large number of relatively small charities. Charities produce differentiated goods. There is free exit and entry uh, into the market for charities in the long run. Charities have control over the type and amount of donations they accept. If we assume that NDFs in a stateless society are like charities, then this is very bad news for defense firms. National defense is an economy of scale. This means that the average cost per unit of defense falls as the scale of output is increased for NDFs. In other words, the NDI will be more efficient by being large than by being small. If the NDFs in a stateless society are relatively small, like charities, and have different interests, then they can be easily overcome by a large, well-funded state army that takes advantage of the economy of scale inherent to the industry. The small, stateless NDFs will always be at a comparative disadvantage in terms of combat ability relative to large state defense firms. If this wasn't enough, there are additional problems. Proponents of the donation argument for national defense admit that in times of peace, donations will be more scarce, and in times of war, they will probably increase. However, this causes yet another problem. Effective modern militaries have huge fixed costs, and they are very large and complicated institutions. They take a long time and a lot of money to organize, run, and maintain. This means that in times of peace, if donations are low, much of the NDI is likely to go bankrupt 
and will not have the funds required to organize and maintain a sufficiently large force capable of defending the area. After a perceived time of peace ends, a stateless society who, whose NDI is funded exclusively by donations will probably be ill-prepared to deal with credible military threats that emerge in the present day. A reactionary flood of donations comes too late to purchase and organize most of what needs to be done and prepared for ahead of time. Modern militaries cannot be formed at the drop of a hat. Military hardware has to be produced, research programs have to be organized and funded, a chain of command has to be formed, different kinds of troops have to be trained and organized, the principal agent problem, communication problems, and cooperation problems have to be dealt with and overcome. This takes years and years of large sustained capital investment and huge organization efforts which cannot be consistently disdained by donations or formed at the drop of a hat. Thirdly, never in the history of the world has a totally voluntarily funded NDI existed in the long run. Not only this, but states that have near universal support by their own populations have never once been able to fund their military entirely through donations. The US military has always accepted donations. In early 2003, U.S. US citizen support for the war in Iraq was about 75% of the entire population. At the time, the U.S. military, despite getting record numbers of donations, was nowhere close to paying for the budget from the donations they received. During World War I and World War II, the state had over 90% of public support for the war, or the American state did. However, everyday citizens never donated enough to fund either of these wars. History gives us no reason to think that patriotic donation giving would ever constitute a sufficiently reliable basis to pay for national defense. To assume otherwise is to assume that a huge number of people would suddenly display severe altruistic behavior while doing so in a way that is individually irrational. As, they, as these people would deliberately make themselves worse off and receive no additional benefit whatsoever. This would be a huge assumption that has no historical precedent whatsoever. Furthermore, people who argue this view seem to commit the fallacy of wishful thinking. They seem to think that because they believe or want something to be the case, that it will in fact be the case when we have no reason to think this. This is a classic example of a non sequitur. I wish I had a billion dollars, and I wish I had the power to be irresistible to any woman of my choosing. Yet sadly, like the argument of the anarchists, this is not the case. 2. Ostracism Let us move on. The second response given by anarchists in response to the free rider problem of national defense I like to call the ostracism argument for national defense. The argument goes as follows. A majority of individuals and firms in society will use social pressure and will ostracize, refuse to do business with, and will disassociate from free riders. If free riders understand that they will be unable to get jobs or buy food, that they'll be unable to sell goods or conduct business, that they'll eventually wise up and pay for defense, as it will be rational for them to do so. Furthermore, goes the argument, firms that sell to free riders will be ostracized by the general public and by other firms. So, to avoid losing revenue by being ostracized, firms will conform to the preferences of the mob and will ostracize free riders. There are several problems with this. The first problem is what I like to call the problem of the Orwellian society. In order for businesses and firms to discriminate against free riders, they have to figure out a way of discovering who is paying for defense and who is not. Otherwise, there will be no effective way to discriminate against free riders. To effectively do this requires assuming several crazy things. One. The entire NDI has to be willing to release the names of all people in the area currently paying for defense. Two, all of those names have to be somehow added to a publicly accessible database. 
three. Someone will have to go acquire a list of names detailing everyone who lives in the area, presumably through spying. Four, the vast majority of firms and individuals who pay for defense have to be both willing and able to discriminate against free riders. Five, all firms must have an electronic e-verify system with a card scanner and consumer software which allows employees to cross-reference every customer's ID with an online database to verify if such persons were in fact free riding on defense or if they were not. Six, most firms would have to perform this e-verify check on every single customer during every single business transaction. Seven, the majority of, or the vast majority of firms and individuals would have already have to pay for national defense. Eight, households and firms would need a way to spy on other households and firms to figure out if those households and firms are doing business with free riders. The problems for this should be very obvious at this point, and they are as follows. One, individuals who pay for national defense may have privacy concerns and may not want their firm releasing their personal information to a publicly accessible database. Two, firms might not want to release the names of their customers to their competitors for fear of losing them to their competitors. Three, who is going to pay for this publicly accessible database full of national defense customers and what incentive do they have to provide this service? Four, it is individually irrational for both firms and individuals to discriminate against and ostracize free riding individuals and firms. Now this is a very important point. As we have mentioned earlier, the cost of a single individual not paying for national defense to firms or other individuals is virtually zero. Because one person not paying for defense makes an almost no statistical difference in the grand scheme of providing national defense. This raises the question, what incentive do firms have to discriminate against free riders? Imagine for a minute that I'm Safeway and a single free rider who lives in my community walks in my store. Suppose for a minute that the average person who lives in my community spends a thousand dollars a year in my store. Now, the cost of this dude in my store, free riding, in terms of my total revenue as a business is zero. However, I know that, that his potential revenue is about a thousand dollars a year. Thus, if I discriminate against this person, the opportunity cost of me doing so would likely be a thousand dollars. If I do business with him, my opportunity cost is extremely low, as I don't give up anything. Thus, a profit -seeking, for a profit-seeking firm, it is rational for me not to discriminate against free riders. What anarchists are really proposing by saying that firms will discriminate and ostracize individuals who don't pay for goods is that all firms in society would form a cartel. The problem for them is, since the society in question is a free market with no barriers to entry or exit, would-be entrepreneurs would have an incentive to start up new firms that don't discriminate against free riders because their total revenues would be higher than firms that do discriminate. Furthermore, all firms currently in the cartel would have an incentive to break ranks and to stop discriminating, thus undercutting the competition for the sake of additional profit. Firms receive no additional revenues by ostracizing free riders. They actually lose revenue by discriminating. Therefore, firms are acting rationally if they generally don't discriminate. To assume most or all firms would do this to their customers is to assume that most or all firms in society would behave in a consistently irrational way. As a side note, I find it amazing that many anarchists are just fine with using the free rider problem as an argument against communism or communal property, but ignore their past arguments entirely when someone points out that the free rider problem is a problem for their system of defense. 
market anarchists such as Thomas De Lorenzo in his book How Capitalism Saved America. Uh, he says in his book, quoting U.S. historians, quote, The first American settlers arrived in Jamestown in May of 1607. There in Virginia, Tidewater region, they found incredibly fertile soil and a cornucopia of seafood, wild game, such as deer and turkey of all kinds. Nevertheless, within six months, all but 38 of the original 104 Jamestown settlers were dead, most having succumbed to the famine. Two years later, the Virginia Company set, sent more than 500 recruits to settle Virginia, and with six, within six months, a staggering 440 were dead. In his book, Thomas de Lorenzo points out that the famine was induced by the settlers' system of collective property and collectivized agricultural production. This is because every single settler received an equal share of food from the harvest regardless of how much work they did. Thus, no individual settler had any incentive to plant or tend more crops since no one individual would no receive any noticeably larger quantity of food by working harder. The result of this free rider problem was the slow, painful death of almost all the settlers. Thomas de Lorenzo also mentioned that the famine was stopped almost immediately when the settlers implemented systems of private property, which gave individuals an incentive to increase their levels of farming. The settlers in Jamestown used extreme levels of social pressure to encourage people uh, to work harvesting crops. Yet not even extreme social pressure solved the free rider problem in Jamestown enough to prevent the deaths of hundreds of early American set like settlers from perverse incentives inherent to their system of property. If social pressure didn't work then, why would it be an end-all solution for anarchists? Fifthly, it costs money to implement a system of e-verification. A firm has to purchase the machines, the card readers, the software, and to pay employees to implement the process. This money could be better spent on other things which actually give the firm marginal benefits. 6. It collectively takes a long time to run ID checks on every single customer for every single business transaction. This time could be better spent by employees doing other things. Furthermore, it makes the business atmosphere very awkward and Orwellian for both the employees and the customers. 7. Proponents of the ostracism argument already assume that a majority of people are willing to pay for defense so, th so as to discriminate against others who don't pay for defense. In doing this, they are assuming most of what they are trying to prove, i.e. begging the question. 8. Lastly, it would be irrational for firms and households to waste time, money, effort, spying on other firms and households for the sake of effectively ostracizing people as they receive no benefit by doing this. To assume this is to assume most of society will behave consistently irrational. Now, to gauge the strength of this ostracism argument, let us use the principle of parsimony to evaluate if the ostracism solution to the free rider problem of defense is stronger, or if the status solution is stronger. The principle of parsimony states that the argument which makes the fewest number of assumptions is more likely to be true, because it is less likely that one of the argument's assumptions is false. The ostracism argument makes eight large assumptions. The statist argument to solve the free rider problem makes two. One, the state will effectively use force against individuals to ensure that they pay taxes. And two, that part of the state's revenue will be used to pay for national defense. The statist argument makes six fewer assumptions than the argument of the anarchists. Therefore, it is a stronger argument that is more likely to be correct. 3. War Insurance Another argument made by market anarchists as a way to address the free rider problem can be called the War Insurance Argument for National Defense. Their argument goes like this. In society, there are individuals who are concerned about losing their property during a war. To meet demand, 
war insurance companies will emerge on an open market to sell insurance policies that cover life, limb, and property in the event of a war. War insurance companies don't want war, just like car insurance companies don't want car crashes. War is bad for business. To deter other invading states from invading, war insurance companies would finance national defense with a portion of the revenue they acquire from people who purchase their insurance policies. Or, in the event of invasion, companies would finance an NDF to drive back the invading army in order to mitigate losses caused by having to pay out money to consumers on their insurance policies. While this argument may sound plausible at first, it is fatally flawed and does not address the free rider problem at all. First, if I know lots of other people have purchased war insurance and I know that war insurance companies finance defense providers who protect my life and my property regardless if I pay or not, why would I buy war insurance or national defense? I know that in any event my life and my property will be defended by the national defense providers. So, I'd be acting rationally if I spent my money on other things and did not pay for defense, i.e. free rided. If everyone thinks this way and behaves rationally, then no one will buy war insurance and the NDFs won't be financed. War insurance is just a continuation of the free rider problem, not a solution to it. Furthermore, War insurance companies can only hire NDI protection out of, the, out of the profit they make selling insurance policies. States have no such financial limit. When financing a war, for states, the ability to finance their war is largely based on the state's ability to tax, to borrow money, uh, or to print enough money, and, as well as the political will to conduct war. Hence. Minimal the minimal financing the NDI receives from the war insurance company profits will pale in comparison to the potential revenue states can give their military through deficit spending, taxation, and inflation. Thus, a stateless society's NDI will always be at a comparative disadvantage in terms of funding with a conventional state military. Also, Paying for an ongoing national defense is extremely costly for war insurance companies because of the high fixed cost of national defense. Thus, insurance companies that offered individual war insurance protections without hiring NDFs could consistently offer their consumers comparatively lower insurance prices than those insurance companies who paid for defense. Therefore, War insurance companies who paid for defense would always be at a comparative disadvantage relative to insurance companies that did not, and such companies would always be weeded out of the marketplace. We see a similar phenomenon with hurricane insurance today. Hurricanes are devastating and rack up huge costs for insurance companies. However, do insurance companies today hire thousands and thousands of aircraft and purchase tons and tons of silver iodide to cloud seed hurricanes when they're over the open ocean in order to reduce the size of the hurricane so they cause less damage? No, they don't. Why? Primarily because it's too expensive and the result is uncertain. However, it is also because firms that cloud seed would quickly go out of business because other firms who free ride off their efforts would do better. Hurricane insurance companies are better off paying for damages if and when hurricanes destroy homes instead of trying to prevent the hurricanes themselves. The same is true of war insurance, uh, war insurance providers hiring national defense firms to hot fight war. Number four, war bonds. These, these so-called solutions just get worse and worse. Anyway, a uh, fourth argument anarchists give to solve the free rider problem I shall call the war bonds argument for national defense. The argument is quite simple and it goes like this. To finance day-to-day -day operations, NDFs will issue war bonds. These bonds will cover the balance of the extremely high fixed cost of the NDI. Let us remember that a bond is a kind of debt security. 
in which the bond issuer legally owes the bondholder's debt. Depending on the terms of the bond, the bond issuer is legally obligated to pay interest over time on the principal amount lent to the purchaser, and then to finally re repay the principal amount at a later date. The, uh, the, uh, the later date is called the bond's maturity, by the way. Uh, people only buy bonds from people they have good reason to believe will be able to pay them back. If one has good reason to believe that a bond issuer won't pay back the principal amount plus interest, then it is a stupid idea to give the bond issuer money. Since national defense is a public good with a free rider problem, if we assume society is acting rationally on an individual level, the total revenue of firms will be zero. If we assume society acts irrationally a small amount of the time, which is the predominant assumption of economics today, then only a few people will buy defense. From this we can safely infer that the total revenues of the NDI will be very small. Why would anyone in their right mind buy bonds from an industry they have no reason would be ever able to pay the debt back? Furthermore, if most of the NDI was financed by bonds, the result would be a Ponzi scheme, where debt from one bond was used to pay the coupon and maturity of another bond, all of which was financed with debt from yet another bond, and so on and so forth. In this event, the whole system would collapse in the long run. The credibility of the NDI would be eroded, as NDFs at some point would fail to pay back their debts due to the Ponzi schemes stacking up on top of each other. Thus, in the long run, no one would be willing to buy bonds from the NDI, and defense would not be provided in such a stateless society. Moving on. Number 5. Rules of Anarchism, the NAP, and the Intersubjective Consensus The next argument is one of the silliest. I call it the naive natural rights solution to national defense. It goes like this. In a stateless society, everyone will accept the non-aggression principle and self-ownership. Thus, national defense isn't a problem because everyone will behave morally and there will be an intersubjective consensus that national defense is not needed and it won't be demanded. This is merely another example of fallacious wishful thinking. In other words, proponents of this argument wish that everyone accepted and followed their moral system. However, merely wishing society would follow one's own morals does not logically entail that people will accept and follow one's own morals, as there are other kinds of moral systems they could follow. One's own morals do not determine how people in the world behave. If I think wearing ear gauges is immoral, it does not follow from, from this that other people won't, we won't wear them if I wish that they didn't wear them. Six. Wishful Market Fundamentalist Thinking About the Unknown Future The sixth argument for solving the free rider problem that anarchists use I will term the argument for naive market optimism about the unknown future. The argument is pretty straightforward. It goes like this. The future is uncertain. Many of the attempts of humans to predict the future and future societies have failed. But since markets in the past have done an efficient job at allocating goods and services, the market will hopefully be able, in the future, to work out a good solution with the right incentives required to overcome the free rider problem and a stateless future. This answer is a non-answer to the free rider problem for two reasons. First, while it is true that markets have had a long successful history of allocating private goods and services in an efficient manner without shortage or, sh or, or surplus. It is not true that markets have historically been able to deal with public goods in an efficient manner because of collective action problems. We call these market failures. This is because firms cannot exclude people from receiving the benefits of their public goods if they don't pay. Hence, 
people have never had any incentive to pay firms for public goods. Thus, this analogy between past success leading to future success is false because it extrapolates a kind of market success that did not actually occur in the past on to the future. Furthermore, this view appears to be a kind of naive market fundamentalism where it is just assumed without proof that ordinary market functioning will always lead to an optimal solution. If someone came to me and said, there is such and such a problem with society, and I replied, don't worry, the state will pass a law to fix it, I could rightly be accused of status fundamentalism. The same is true with religion. If someone came to me in an existential crisis and and I said, aha, don't worry, God will take care of it, I could rightly be accused of religious fundamentalism or magical thinking. The same is true here. Uh, this, the same criticism can be accurately levied on anarchists who use this wishful thinking as a knee-jerk response to the free rider problem of statelessness and national defense. Number 7. Guerrilla War and Militias the seventh argument for overcoming the free rider problem is what I like to call the argument for national defense by guerrilla war and militias. The argument goes as follows. In the event of an invasion by a foreign hostile power, people in a stateless society will be so moved by their love of liberty and their hatred of the invading army that many of them will voluntarily form militias. These militias will conduct a long, bloody guerrilla war of attrition so as to bog down the enemy and break their will to fight so that they'll leave eventually. This argument, like so many others, rests on a large number of bad assumptions. One, that a substantial minority or majority of anarchists in the event of an invasion are willing and able, out of an insane level of patriotism, to make themselves worse off, to put their life, their health, their property, their family, and their friends at risk in order to fight a guerrilla war against a large invading state army. Two, that militias have enough men, training, logistical ability, to tra Two, that militias have enough men, arms, training, and logistical ability to drive out the invading armies. Three, that militias are both willing and able to conduct a violent, prolonged war of attrition with huge losses on both sides to break down the enemy's will to fight gradually over time. Four, that the many attempts to pacify the stateless society by the invading state using pacification methods which have worked throughout history will be ineffective. 5. That in the event of a new invasion, all the previous assumptions will hold. 6. That the large security threats from terrorist groups who are not conventional armies can be effectively tackled by militias. Now let us go through these assumptions one by one and challenge their soundness. Then let us compare parsimoniously this anarchist solution to the free rider problem to say the status solution. 1. Concerning the first assumption, it would be good to point out that militias use voluntary conscription to recruit soldiers who they pay little or nothing in compensation for time spent soldiering. It is also worth noting that individual soldiers make no statistically significant difference in a war between two armies. Thus, from an individual level, people who join militias to combat an invading army or state are acting irrationally. They are putting their lives, their health, their property, their friends, and their families at great risk, and they do so with little or no payoff as they get nothing in wages and make no important difference to the war effort if that is indeed their goal. Thus, to make the national defense argument for the guerrilla war and militias, we have to assume that a majority or large majority of people in a stateless society will behave in a way that is generally individually irrational, though collectively rational. 
we must also assume that they will do this often. This assumption requires a strong argument, and it is not borne out by history. Thus we have no reason to believe it whatsoever. Furthermore, there are additional cultural concerns in the United States as to the viability of this option. According to Hofstede's Index of Individualism, which is the best respected index measuring individualism by country in the social science today, ranks the U.S. at number one for individualism relative to other countries. People in individualist societies tend to act more out of their own individual self-interest, whereas people in collectivist societies that have a sense of group duty and obligation, such as those in China or Japan, are more likely to act in a way that is rational for the collective. We can therefore conclude that because our culture is an individualistic culture, the guerrilla war and militias option would be very unlikely to emerge because more people in the U.S. are motivated by individual rationality more of the time. Secondly, since militias are funded by voluntary donations, instead of, ta uh, instead of state taxation or inflation, militias have a comparative disadvantage at providing defense against states because they cannot meet their costs as well as states can. Furthermore, militias are reactionary solutions. They form or gain most of their soldiers in the event of a conflict, not prior to a conflict. So any solution that involves militias will be largely reactionary and will not be a proactive solution like conventional militaries are. Hence, militias will not be able to retain the military advantage of purchasing large numbers of arms and organizing large numbers of men prior to a war. They will have to do this after or during a war. 3. It is highly unlikely that an immense group of brainwashed uber-anarchists would be willing to fight a long, horrible, bloody, wealth-destroying, protracted war of attrition which would make them individually worse off in the long run. 4. States have a remarkable ability to employ the calculated use of force to crush, overwhelm, and pacify rebellions. State armies or police forces have had have very often throughout history have been able to pacify populations or militias with remarkable success. In American history we can see examples of states doing this in the Whiskey Rebellion and in Shays Rebellion. Furthermore, the Nazis for instance were able to employ pacification techniques with wide success throughout Western Europe an industrialized upscale population. When the Nazis invaded Western Europe. They were often instructed, uh, the soldiers were often instructed not to damage any property or initiate violence against any passive citizens. They were told that if they did these things they would face a firing squad. Nazi soldiers were given training and etiquette and were instructed to be very polite to the native population. Also, the Nazi state would set an official exchange rate between the country they took over and the German Deutschmark. Then they would give their soldiers four to six months extra pay and instruct them to splurge it amongst the local businesses to win them support with the business community. Prior to invasion, German army intelligence would gather a list of names of revolutionaries or intellectuals who are likely to oppose the regime. When the Nazis invaded, these dissenters would mysteriously vanish, i.e. be killed in the night in large numbers. That way, the Nazis could crush acts of dissent before they even began, without many people knowing about it. Later, the Germans would erect signs and issue public service announcements, saying that the civilized way the Nazis were currently treating the occupied citizens would disappear if they resisted or if partisans attacked or sabotaged the German army. In the event of resistance, the occupied population was told, the German high command would let their army steal, rape, murder, seize property, brutalize, assault the population, and do all manner of horrible things to them. 
This pacification tactic was so remarkably successful that no Nazi-occupied state was ever overthrown by revolutionaries, and most of the occupied cities, townships, and regions offered little to no resistance on the, on the aggregate. Hence, anarchists who support the militia argument have to make the very unlikely ahistorical assumption that an invading foreign power would always be totally unable to pacify the native, stateless population. 5. It is unlikely for militias to receive ongoing support for the war in the long run. Sane people generally don't want to fight a long, bloody war of attrition. They want to make the best of their circumstance, make some money, and get on with their lives. 6. Militias are generally not equipped with or designed to deal with non-conventional warfare, such as responding to terrorist security threats. These would present a real problem for militias, but not a problem for states or state militaries who are designed to deal with such threats. All right, let's move on to number eight, PDAs. The eighth argument proposed by anarchists to overcome the free rider problem is what I call the private defense agency solution to national defense. The argument goes like this. People demand local defense. They want their homes and their families protected. State PDAs will provide local defense. Their service will be a private good. It will be rival and exclusive, i.e. firms will not respond to the crime scene and investigation of people who don't pay for defense. And the services of PDA agents uh, through investigation or direct protection of a single customer cannot be simultaneously consumed by other people. In addition to local defense, PDAs will use their revenue to uh, finance national defense. If this seems to you, if it seems to you that this argument doesn't address the free rider problem of national defense at all, then you are absolutely correct. The argument for PDAs does not propose any solution to transfor or transform national defense, a public good, into a private good. If some PDA provides national defense with the revenue they get from providing local defense, then they will be outcompeted by PDAs who only provide local defense and don't spend their resources on things that don't generate additional revenue, i.e. national defense. All right. Now that we've examined all of these anarchist solutions, what can we conclude from them? I think we can safely conclude that anarchists have not currently offered any plausible solution to the free rider problem of national defense. I think we can also say that if anarchists ever want to make their ideal society a reality, they will have to either find a solution to this fundamental free rider problem or let their ideas be relegated to the closet of history, a closet full of failed ideas. Before I end this video, I'll briefly mention my proposal, which I hope to be able to go into in future videos. My proposal is as follows. A stateless society's polycentric legal order, and my solution, would pass common law making it illegal for firms who provide either local defense or legal services not to bundle their system or their service with national defense. In other words, under the law, all people who have purchased local defense or legal services would have to purchase national defense, otherwise they would not receive local defense or legal services. New firms or existing firms who tried to provide local defense or legal services without bundling it with national defense first would be shut down and would be prevented from doing so by the polycentric legal agencies. While this may seem harsh, the, lo the horrible consequences uh, caused by domestic security threats and foreign imperialist states in the absence of national defense are too great. There is too much potential for death, economic depression, bloodshed, terrorism, wealth destruction, suffering, and cultural destruction to ignore the key issue of national defense. Furthermore, no sane person would be against prohibiting legal agencies 
uh, or local defense agencies that made it legal or acceptable to brutally murder people, to torture people, to molest infants, or to steal money from poor people, or to detonate nuclear weapons in the city. Similarly, no one would be against prohibiting legal agencies that made it illegal to defend yourself, to, uh, to mow your lawn, or to drive your car. Every sane person would be ex fine with using force to prohibit deviant agencies which allowed for a greater social harm, such as the ones I have mentioned. Not having national defense is obviously a great social harm. Therefore, if we would accept this argument in the aforementioned cases, it makes sense to accept it also for national defense. <sighs> At the end of the day, people are anarchists or are anti-statists not because they think that anarchism is the final goal, but because they think the set of theories and propositions proposed by anarchists, if implemented, would lead to a better life. If we have good reason to believe that some bit of currently accepted anarchist theory would not lead to a better life, and we do have good reason to believe this, then it makes sense to either change the theory so that it would lead to a better life, or to abandon it outright. In this case, I think a change is necessary.